Every Nintendo hero has their own unique set of skills and powers. From those who can wield the sword, to those who can use mushrooms to grow in size, to those capable of commanding aliens that look like carrots. But with Nintendo's vast army of heroes, we want to know which ones are truly the most powerful. I'm Kifinosi with 1UP Binge, and this is Nintendo Heroes, weak to powerful. Of course, guidelines have to be placed. The term strength is very nebulous, and odds are your list will be very divergent from ours. We're gonna try and view the characters in as pure of a light as possible, as in how strong they are without any outside help or gadgets. After that, then we'll account for power-ups that they have access to at pretty much all times, as well as how many powerful foes they've bested. After that, we'll look at any one-time feats that may push them above another character. Finally, we should talk about what we mean by strength and power. We're focusing on just how mighty these heroes are. Basically, if they were put in a fight to the death, who would be the last one standing? With all that said, this ranking is going to be very subjective, and if you disagree with anything we say, that's perfectly fine. Actually, just let us know your thoughts down below. First up, we have the Harmed by Paper tier. These two fighters are characters with extremely limited combat functions and would be severely disadvantaged in a real fight. Starting off these not-so-heavy hitters is the space explorer Olimar. Now, anyone that's seen the Nintendo villain's weakest to strongest list can tell where this is going, and they would be right to have such assumptions. Olimar may have the impressive title of being a spacefarer, doing cargo runs for his company on Hokutate. However, there is one thing that really cuts him down to size. That being his size. He's around three quarters of an inch, while the Pikmin he controls are 1.14 inches tall, easily outclassing the captain himself. This is a huge blow to the captain already, with him being the smallest Nintendo protagonist to date. Sure, Olimar can try and fight the creatures on the planet with his fists, and he does get a couple of upgrades in the second game to make himself more durable and resist the elements of PNF 404. Still, this captain's true strength comes from his Pikmin, and without them, he's absolutely easy pickings. Next is the personal help a robot, Chibi Robo. Since they're all made to be pretty much the same size alongside having similar powers, we're just going to be grouping them all together. Immediately, he's already doing better than Olimar, being a whopping 3.94 inches tall. We joke, but he does have some other tools that can help him out. In the first game for the GameCube, he's packing heat with a little arm blaster on his arm, and then he gets that upgraded thanks to the charge chip and Mr. Sanderson upgrading it further. There are also the items he picks up around the house, like the coffee mug that can block shots, the toothbrush for cleaning stuff up, and there's also a spoon, perfect for digging up spots or whacking enemies. There are also the Chibi Robo's cords, which are usually used for recharging them, but in Ziplash could also be used as a whip to attack foes and pull objects, or to act as a grappling hook or makeshift helicopter blades for Chibi Robo. So yeah, while he is more powerful than Olimar, he can still only get so far due to his small size. They do have the giant Chibi Robo, but given how it's another robot that needs to be put together, we're not going to count that one. So sure, he's definitely a step and size up from Olimar, but he's still a toy, not ready for the big leagues. Next up is the Gym Class newbies tier. These are characters that, while they may be able to last a bit longer than the previous two, probably aren't going to be winning any real fights due to a lack of real power. Next up we have the original portable Nintendo character, Mr. Game & Watch. Given that the nature of these games is all about repetition and trying to get a high score, these guys really aren't that focused on being powerful. They're just mundane workers in various jobs. Zookeepers, ball jugglers, guys that make sure oil doesn't spill into people in their open fires, chefs. They're pretty much jacks of all stats. That's Masters of None. They are explained a bit more in Smash Brothers Brawl's subspace mode, with them being a species of creatures that are easily influenced by those around them. One of Nintendo's overall more important characters, but one of their weaker ones as well. We have to figure out who the best that there ever was here is, and the Pokemon Trainer is up next. Basically, we're counting every single incarnation of them into one entry. As you may expect, they're just kids who want to go on adventures and travel the world of Pokemon, training and capturing the Pokemon as they go along in the world. While alone, they're no threat, the Pokemon Pokemon they can capture are much more powerful and willing to obey them. This, though, is another Porky Minch dilemma here, as while alone they are no threat, their Pokemon can range from being guard dogs to satanic archetypes willing to serve them. Yeah, it's a bit of a power dynamic problem here. With their powerful pets, they can not only take down other Pokemon trainers, but criminal organizations, from those that just want to kidnap Pokemon, to groups capable of erasing all of existence so their leader can make a new world in the fallen world's place. Even if they aren't strong on their own, they get the job done very well. However, there is an expectation 
expectation for these Pokemon trainers. And that's with the star workers of Team Galactic, Rei and Akari. After getting teleported into the past by Arceus, they have to basically teach the past all about Pokemon with their much more advanced knowledge from living in the future. While also capable of just capturing Pokemon, and also capturing a powerful demon, and impressing the god of their universe to let them capture and use one of Arceus's many forms, they do have their own strengths. For starters, Rei and Akari basically live off the land, picking up supplies they see in the wild and using them for their items, creating Pokeballs, healing items for their Pokemon, and tools for making the process of capturing them easier. They're also capable of dodge rolling out of danger and are able to be blasted by attacks from wild Pokemon. They get seriously hurt by this, but they don't die. Hey, you try being attacked by an Alpha Snorlax. See how that feels. That said, they are still kids, so while they are more resourceful than the other trainers, they're still around the bottom of the food chain. Rounding out this tier, we have the Playful War members, Inklings, and Octolings. Now, sure, they have powerful weapons to paint the land around them, and this weaponry is able to attack and kill other Inklings, Octolings, and Octarians, but that's the problem. This weaponry is very situational. It's useful and scary in turf wars and battle modes, but outside of that, it just makes for a new way to paint stuff. Now, getting hit by paintballs will still hurt, but it's not as lethal as other foes here. Plus, the whole dying to water thing is also something that we really can't see as convenient for them. With the games themselves, they're more than powerful enough to save the day from stopping DJ Octavio and freeing the Zapfish and Callie, or even saving the world, even if DJ Octavio pitched in to help them. While they are more than enough in their home world, in other places, they make for very easy refill tanks for paint. Now, give them real weapons, then we could put them higher up. But as of now, while they are weaker than other characters here, we don't think being on the wrong side of their weaponry is wise. Next up, we have the Average Joes tier. These are the middle-of-the-road characters that can put up a fight if push comes to shove but they're also pretty average when it comes to heroic power. First up, we have the Villager coming on in. Yeah, Villager definitely looks like they're just another case like Mr. Game & Watch, with there not being anything really special about them. And yeah, most of the stuff they can do is either done by just acting like a friendly person, by giving the other animal villagers stuff, or donating to the museum. However, what pushes them up above others is New Horizons. Here, the game allows you to customize your island, right down to terraforming the landscape. You can knock down parts of the island, build up new sections, and even uproot trees by eating fruit and using your shovel, it's definitely a step up from asking Isabel to help fund a new bridge, to say the least. While this is definitely impressive for any human, this is still pretty much on the lesser side of things here. Speeding on in is Captain Falcon. Now, if we were to include the anime, that would definitely pump this driver up a fair bit. That being said, Captain Falcon is still a pretty fierce-looking person. We're willing to bet those muscles aren't entirely just for show. As a bounty hunter, he's able to track down and get his prey, either by using racing to get them, or by using his gun. Either one works. That said, he really isn't a fighter, and is more of a racer. He lets his racing skills solve his problems for the most part. Now, while we don't see him fighting fist to fist very much, have you seen the speeds these cars go? They're insane, to say the least and as such, you need a strong body to support all those insane speeds and turns, so Captain Falcon definitely is durable in that regard. Still though, without any actual fighting experience, we can only put this fan favorite so high up. Maybe if Nintendo makes a new game and shows off the Falcon Punch in the game, then we can put him higher up, but for now he's stuck in the pit stop, sadly. Entering the way in at around the half point mark is the flyweight Little Mac. For once, we actually have a character who specializes in fighting, and it shows! Under the training of Doc Lewis, he pushed his body to as far as it could go, being the pint-sized powerhouse from the Bronx. Despite being smaller than his foes and only 17 years old, he's more than able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against some of the strongest boxers in the world, including a boxer that uses magic for his attacks, a boxer that takes drugged soda to give himself power, and even the champion becoming the new champion. Sure, he is just another regular human, but when he specializes in boxing and is able to take down foes well out of his weight class without getting beaten down himself, he definitely earns this spot and recognition from the other heroes here. It may not be the champion belt, but it's nothing to... It's nothing to sneeze at. For the first of our Fire Emblem heroes, it's your boy, Roy. This heir is a proficient sword user, being able to use his sword on the battlefield to his advantage. With his sword, he's not only capable of cutting down those who are stronger than him, but also uses it to heal his own wounds, deal critical damage against dragons, and even boost his own defenses. Plus, his critical hit attack is just as deadly as it is in Smash. While he is kind of just a swordsman, compared to the others so far, he's definitely a sign of Nintendo characters starting to become more fighters while still maintaining their friendly edge. Still, he is a sword 
swordsman with a magic sword. Anyone would be rightfully scared and smart to keep their distance from him. For yet another sword wielder, we have the legendary hero king, Marth. Take everything from Roy and pump it up to 11. Marth is a fighter aiming to bring peace to his land, no matter how many enemies he has to take down to get it. Alongside being a sword fighter, he's able to use light magic thanks to his Naga Holy Blood, restore health with his life sphere, but also heal with his sword, the Falchion. And there are also special spheres that he can use to manipulate the ground, prevent mind control, or even preserve weapons and strengthen them. Marth also has the Shield of Seals, the Binding Shield. With this shield, he can seal up Earth Dragons and can see through illusions. Definitely starting to see how powerful these Nintendo heroes can get, huh? For the final destination on this tier, no items, Fox only. This spacefaring mammal is a bounty hunter, traveling from planet to planet in his spaceship to fight for peace against Andros. As a fox, he's much quicker and swifter than a human, alongside having some great agility and athletics to him. While he is able to defend himself with just a staff, that's not what we know him for. His main feats come from his weaponry. On the ground, he has plenty of toys to play with, from blasters, machine guns, homing launchers, and plasma cannons, to classic grenades. However, his biggest and greatest tool comes in the form of his vehicles. The R-Wing is a fighter plane that can take down enemies in outer space, and thanks to Fox's reaction speeds, he's able to steer that spacecraft through some hazardous conditions, all the way up to Andross's front door to shoot his true form down. There's also Fox's Landmaster when missions have to take place on the ground, which is just as deadly, being able to shoot at enemies and blow them up, of course. Needless to say, this crafty fox has all the tools he needs for his missions. Now we're really getting to the powerful heroes as we enter the rough and tough tier. These are characters that possess a great deal of strength, either by being super strong, having some sort of supernatural ability, or a mixture of both. The first member of this tier is the driver of the Aegis, Rex. Once a salvager, he ended up getting roped into dealing with the Aegis after a mission to get it ended with him getting betrayed and killed. Now a driver of the Aegis, he sets out to bring Pyra and Mithra to Elysium. With the Aegis, he's able to call forth plenty of different blades to help damage his foes. These blades also have their own arts, allowing Rex to increase his damage, increase his stats for a fight, and heal himself. He's also able to instantly kill his foes with the Slayer skills, which definitely is a good show of strength, even if RNG is heavily involved. Still, these skills were enough for him to beat the secret group called Torna, taking out Malos, another blade, and Jin, the original paragon of Torna, with the two of them threatening to kill the god of Alrest, the architect. Being able to say that you saved God definitely is something that you would put on your resume, to say the least. Also, according to Xenoblade 3, Rex is the first Nintendo character here to have three different wives at the exact same time and have them all be happy with children. That's probably the most powerful action one man can do, in a way. Moving from Rex onto the original, we have the wielder of the Monado, Shulk. Once a researcher in Colony 9, he ends up having to pick up the Monado in order to help protect his colony and get revenge on Metal Face for killing Fiora. With this tool, he's able to not only deal more damage to mechanical enemies, but also use clairvoyance techniques with his sword, allowing him to look into the future and be alert to any potential threats that could threaten him and his party. This isn't the only technique his sword can do, though, as it can help boost his stats. His power, defense, and speed are all able to be boosted by the Monado. With his trusty blade upgraded, Shulk was also able to become a threat to Zanza, an actual god. Yeah, it's only going to get crazier going forward. Buckle up. Now, while still ultimately a human, as he does give up godhood, Shulk has proven to have the brains and willpower, alongside the tools, to get the job done. Grouping these four kids together, next we have Ness's team from Earthbound. By themselves, they are just four kids, if not for the fact that they all have extraordinary powers. Jeff is capable of inventing powerful weapons for his crew and giving himself some strong tools, like his famous bottle launcher. However, the real strength comes from Ness, Paula, and Pooh. Yes, that's his actual name. Don't laugh. They all have something called Psy or PK moves. These are called psionics or psychokinesis moves, using the person's mind to attack their foes. They're all capable of using this power, from stealing power from the enemies for themselves to use, shielding themselves, powering up, teleporting around the world, using telepathy to reach out all over the world, and of course, using elemental powers and even the powers of stars themselves to crush their enemies. Even if the player is needed to finally end Gygas, this group was more than capable of pushing Gygas to the brink where he had to change forms to preserve himself. Alongside just getting there in the first place, basically fighting through an alien invasion, Ness and his ragtag team of friends definitely fought their way up to a spot this high up. Jumping on next for a feast, we have an entry fit for a king, King DDD or rather a self-titled king. This penguin king rules over Dreamland with a mighty flipper. Being the rival of Kirby definitely means you're probably able to put up a fight. While this king may not be able to match Kirby's might, he's still a very strong and mighty friend. Despite his reputation of being easily possessed, when he gets a chance to fight back, he can easily match the power of other threats if given the chance. When teaming up with Kirby in Return to Dreamland, DDD is just as capable of beating down Magalore and the Master Crown, a being capable of controlling the entire universe had he not been stopped. Then there's the penguin's crowning feat in D 
DDD tour. This is Kirby Triple Star's main story mode with King DDD starring, going on to beat down Queen Sectonia, an evil version of himself, and even the Dimension Mirror as he jumps into it and takes down Dark Meta Knight, an evil version of Meta Knight. Even if there are other heroes more powerful than him in Dreamland alone, King DDD still earns enough respect to hail to the king. He's not the leader of this bunch of characters, but you still know him just as well. Donkey Kong is here to kick some tail. Once more, just focusing on the DK from Donkey Kong Country and Mario vs. Donkey Kong, this primate is sturdy and powerful enough to beat up his foes by just using his fists. Fighting against King K. Rule, this ape has proven himself to be a serious threat against any invaders. From Kremlings wanting to eat his bananas, to Vikings trying to put the island into an endless winter, and even resisting mind control, even if it was just because he was too dumb to be controlled, this guy's the king of his jungle for a reason. Just like Wario, Donkey Kong gets this high up just due to his sheer strength. The fact that the Mario universe is crazy with its lore also helps, but that's a can of worms for later on in this list. Donkey Kong is able to punch the moon out of orbit and slam it onto the Tiki King. That's a great deal of power right there, putting it mildly. Truly, Donkey Kong is out of this world. From the jungle to the sea. We're swimming with Starfy now. The Kirby of the sea has also dealt with his own fair share of demonic fights. The most common one he fought against is Ogura, a demon so great his power engulfs the ocean's might itself. Starfy's been able to not only go around the world trying to make others happy and befriend everyone, but also fight for their safety. Like with Mashtooth, a beast threatening Bunston's land. Not only is Starfy able to damage him, but also capable of flying through space to chase him down. We're also able to say that Starfy is another Nintendo hero capable of pushing back a moon, stopping Mashtooth's attempt of hurting him by launching back a planetoid back at him, even as he tried to blast at it with his beam. Still, Starfy is just a kid and isn't able to spin for too long without getting dizzy, and his clumsy nature can also hurt him a bit. Regardless, this is one star who deserves to be called one. Whether that's because he's a literal star or starfish is still up for debate. Now from a sea of water to a sea of stars, the next fighter is Samus Aran. This relentless bounty hunter is hired by the Galactic Federation in order to keep peace among the galaxy. In her attempts to attain peace, she ends up pitted against Mother Brain and Ridley, with the former wanting to put the galaxy under her rule, while Ridley is a space pirate forever hunting Samus after leaving an attack on her planet and killing her parents. Yeah, Samus has a lot of personal beef with Ridley, and a lot of tools that can take him down. With her standard powerful beams, her missiles, and all of her different power suits that give her different powers, it's easy to see that the developers have to keep finding ways to make Samus lose her powers each game to keep things from going out of control. Samus is one of the most powerful beings in the galaxy, with her arsenal being capable of kicking any beast that tries to kill her, with even her own dark side made of Phazon falling to the superior original. Then we find out more about her past in Metroid Dread. It's revealed that she was experimented on by her father in an attempt to create the ultimate warrior. Turns out, Samus is a hybrid of a human, a Chozo, and a Metroid. She is able to get in touch with her Metroid side, siphoning energy from enemies like their mini health packs, and after getting loose with her rage after Ravenbeak almost kills her, she unlocks her Metroid suit, making her even more powerful and releasing a giant hyper beam, leaving the planet in ruins. With this bounty hunter in the galaxy, you can rest easy, even with the cunning god of death Ridley constantly trying to kill her. Standing guard on the edge of this tier is the lone swordsman, Meta Knight. This mysterious masked ball of power is a swordsman, using his master sword, the Galaxia, to help keep the land at peace. Unlike his pink counterpart, Meta Knight only has his sword and wings, and that's more than enough for him to be feared by others. With his sword, he's able to fight off villains and try to hold them off for the good of Dreamland. This includes him fighting against Dark Meta Knight, the invading HAL lab, and the Forgotten Planet's Beast Pack. Now, while Meta Knight does lose by a fair bit in some of these fights, knocking him just out of the top tier, he's still no pushover. Being able to keep up with Kirby, and you guys already know what a powerhouse he can be. This can be seen most prominently in his Meta Knight side modes in Nightmare in Dreamland, Superstar Ultra, and Planet Robobot. Here, he's able to beat Nightmare, computer-generated copies of Sectonia, and Dark Matter, but his rival that he ends up beating is the most powerful sword fighter in the galaxy, Galactic Knight, a being so powerful that he's sealed away because people are scared of his might, and here, Meta Knight's able to go through Kirby's adventures in his stead and prove his worth. He may get beaten a couple of times, but this knight is still very mighty. Finally, standing proudly as Nintendo's mightiest fighters, we have the God Slayers tier. These characters are the strongest of the strong. They have abilities and powers that put them above the rest and are capable of tackling those that are inhumanly powerful, sometimes even capable of beating deities. Starting this tier of the Nintendo Titans, up first is one of the main Nintendo mascots, Link. This hero of time is definitely one of the more elusive characters on the list here. This is due to just how each game technically has a different Link, but even after death, another Link will take his place. They're all in a direct ancestry line 
again, so while they all are technically different, the legend and spirit of Link still lives on. In this way, he'll always be there to end up fighting off the curse of demise, Ganon himself. Unlike the heroes, Ganon is always the same one, continuing to keep on trying to fight and kill Link and Zelda. While Ganon's powers keep on improving, Link has to keep on relying on the weaponry around him to keep Ganon down. And this guy certainly has his fair share of weaponry. From slingshots and sticks to bows and arrows and mallets, anything can be a weapon in Link's hands. The most powerful weapon for him, though, is the Master Sword, the bane of all evil. This blade does more damage to evildoers and is his most trustworthy, unbreakable weapon. Aside from Ganon, Link has also taken down other threats such as the Mask Demon Majora, the Demon King Demise, and the Dark Sorceress Sia. While, aside from his courage and endless lineage, Link is a regular human, his strengths and feats can't go unnoticed. He is the hero of time for a good reason. Now we come to a controversial part of this list. Our next candidate is one a fair amount of people are probably expecting to be at the very top, and that person, entity, is Kirby. Now, once upon a time, Kirby would be laughed at for being this high up here, and now we expect so many people to get angry at the fact that he isn't first, and that is kind of perfectly reasonable. Ever since beating Majin Buu in Death Battle, all eyes have been turned to Kirby for the strongest Nintendo character, and his actions while being the main star and saving everyone in Brawl's subspace mode, and being the sole survivor of Galeem's attack only helped further this claim, but what about his main games? Well, they do paint him as a very strong being. This super tough pink puff is able to swallow his opponents and copy their abilities, and his enemy roster includes a cosmic being who wants to snuff out all the light in the universe, a vain queen who wants to take over Popstar, an all-powerful alien who is captured by humanity and wants to crash Popstar and the Forgotten Land together, to a demon sealed within a treasure chest. Now, the only thing stronger than Kirby is the insane lord that we frankly can only scratch at here. Basically, due to Void being rumored to be heavily related to Dark Matter and having several similarities to Kirby, most tellingly his face, it's hinted that Kirby is at least related to Void as a possible incarnation? Granted, this isn't canon, but it does hold water considering Kirby's feats and power. And now, the part that really hurts us. Answering the question of just why isn't he on the top of the pile? Three main reasons. Firstly, while Kirby can defeat those powerful beings, most of the time he has to rely on super powerful attacks. The Star Rod is used to defeat Nightmare, the Love Love Stick is able to destroy Dark Matter and Zero, Ribbon's Shard Gun is needed to beat Zero too, Kirby can only beat Void by using the Star Sprinkler, which requires him to have three friends with him at the time, and so on. Yeah, Kirby is able to beat these threats, but he needs some help of some kind. Secondly, he's still pretty much a naive child. Magalore is able to take advantage of this to get Kirby to do his dirty work alongside Marks, and even King Dedede is able to trick Kirby by sneaking up behind him after getting beaten by him to steal Elphalan from him. And finally, and most damning, his size. Yeah, you thought this problem was done ever since Chibi-Robo, but no, Kirby is actually only 8 inches tall. And not only that, but the home planet where all these adventures are happening is Popstar, a small star. It's often referred to as a tiny star and planet. It's small enough that the Haltman Works Company is able to just land their ship on the planet, reaching towards all five points of the star. Now this isn't to say that Kirby isn't really powerful, nor are we dismissing his feats. And we can see just where the idea that Kirby is this god of hyperdeath came from. It's just that, in the end, we do think there are a couple of things that keep Kirby from this practical godhood. Overall, yeah, Kirby is extremely powerful and has killed powerful beings, sure, but he's only eight inches tall, and as such, the scale of his world and the scale of his threats, just compared to that of his world, has to be taken into account. Next, just outside of the top three, we have a literally divine force, Pit. As an angel, he's already well acquainted with the idea of fighting deities. He is the sole reason for Medusa's first attack on Skyworld failing, after all. As a devoted follower of Palutina, this angel is more than capable of putting deities in their place. Blessed by Palutina, Pitt is the captain of Palutina's army and has earned his position. Despite his youthful looks, he has a surprising arsenal of weaponry and tools to use. Stabs that can snipe enemies, claws that can swipe at them, and guns that can shoot down divine forces from the sky. Pitt has a variety of tools to choose from. Alongside being able to take down Medusa, he's also shown to be strong enough to take out other deities, like Pandora, Thanatos, Hades, and it's shown that he's able to fight against Palutina herself when she gets possessed. While he does still need help from the gods to give his weapons power, putting him down a bit, come on, he's able to fight against multiple gods in one game and still win. Kirby only really faces one powerful deity per game, so Pitt definitely has Kirby bested on that front. Plus, in the actual credits to Uprising, Hades himself admits that Pitt is the strongest Nintendo character. Keep in mind, Sakurai was the creator behind both Kirby and Pitt, so this 
pretty much confirms that Pit is at least stronger than Kirby, if not the strongest Nintendo character, or at the very least, the strongest character with a consistent universe. Who can possibly beat Pit? Well, how about 100 fighters? For the bronze medal, we have 100 medals to give away for the wonderful 1-0. And no, it's not wonderful 100, it's wonderful 1-0. These guys were created by Platinum Games, the company mostly well known for their flashy action adventure games. That should be more than enough to indicate how powerful they can be. These 100 heroes are scattered around the globe, fighting against the forces of evil and helping out humanity. Among some of the more notable members are Wonder Red, the leader of the group holding everyone together. Wonder Blue, the smug swordsman. Wonder Green, the fastest French firearm fire Wonder Pink, the Wild Whipper, Wonder Yellow, the Modest Mallet Masher, Wonder White, the Credible Claws Carrier, and Wonder Black, the Bomb Blaster. Their powers draw from their group forming up to create weaponry, with their very beings being able to increase the size of these tools. For example, with enough people, Wonder Red's Wonder Hand ability can get bigger, and as such, deal more damage to his enemies. With their powers, they're able to fight against any threat against Earth, and this case has this threat be the alien force called Geth Jerk. Despite their technology and powerful armies capable of taking Taking over the planet, the wonderful 1-0 are able to push them back, destroying their leaders one by one, and proving themselves as Earth's mightiest defenders. They can beat galactic-sized threats because they're the bravest under the sun. They're the wonderful 1-0, the mightiest army on Earth. That being said, even with all this manpower and power and being able to stop threats from destroying the Earth, they aren't quite the best. But what's better than an army of a hundred powerful members? How about a one-man army? For the silver trophy, it's the eternal underdog sneaking his way this high up, Luigi. Now, spoiler alert, but the Mario universe is broken beyond all belief. You could probably sleuth out which hero has the top spot here from seeing his younger brother here, but Luigi is no slouch. Mario and Luigi are what Yoshi's Island DS calls star children, beings capable of extraordinary powers, and it shows. He's the player two for Mario for a reason. He's just as strong as him. He shares all the abilities his brother has, like both of them being excellent jumpers, with Luigi apparently being able to jump all the way from the Mushroom Kingdom to Starship Mario, if Super Mario Galaxy 2 is to be believed. There's also their arsenal, consisting of stars that grant invincibility capes to let them fly over large chunks of levels, and of course, the frog suit for swimming easily underwater. Plus, as of the Mario and Rabbids series, they're packing heat. Alongside using guns, they also have an ability that gives them power to immediately jump out of cover, slow time to a crawl, and take a shot at any enemy moving. And unlike Dio, they don't need a stand to slow down time. Also, the regular enemy that they fight all the time is Bowser. And if you've seen our Nintendo Villains Week to Powerful list, you'll know that despite being pretty goofy at times, Bowser is powerful enough to threaten other insanely powerful beings like Rosalina. Of course, Luigi also has his own string of feats, namely within the Luigi's Mansion series. Here, his arch nemesis is King Boo, who wants to send Luigi to the underwear as fast as possible. This ghost is so demented that he's able to use his powers to warp reality around him in his own pocket dimension, and even threaten the entire dimension so badly that it could be destroyed if he gets his way. No, 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 not just the world. Dimension, like the whole universe. And Luigi is more than capable of capturing King Boo, despite his fear and King Boo's power. Definitely a fine showing for the man in green, alongside tagging along Mario and helping him with his own feats. And of course, you know where this is going. If Luigi is the one with the silver medal of strength, then there's only one person who could top that. His brother, Mario. Now, despite Mario being the face of Nintendo, this is still a bit of an odd choice, especially considering his competition, like Kirby and even Pit. However, first things first, let's take a look at the rules of the Mario universe. All right, now that we've taken a look over the rules of the Mario universe, you should see a problem. There are no rules. Canon is whatever fits at the moment. It's not exactly Toon Force, but more like Toon Logic. If it's funny or awesome to see, then it will happen in the world of Mario. If you want to know how broken the Mario power scaling can be, look no further than the Mario Party games. Examples include Mario and his pals playing Heat Stroke on the sun and not be worse for wear, even when bouncing off the sun from being burnt by it. Black Hole Boogie, involving Mario and friends trying to outswim a black hole and getting spat out as if nothing happened, and a swim around in zero gravity with complete control and getting smashed by meteors without only being a mere inconvenience for them in Mass Meteor. After failing to get the license for a Popeye game, Mario was created in the likeness of Popeye, with Donkey Kong being his Brutus. When it comes to power, the Mario universe definitely takes after the sailor inspiration. The canon in the Mario games is so broken it leads to many insane feats the Mario Brothers do, alongside beating powerful beings like Kulex, a god from another universe, the Dark Star, basically the Mario universe's version of Satan, Dark Fawful, which is Fawful possessing the core of the Dark Star's power, as once that's dead, Dark Bowser also starts getting weakened, the Mega Bug, someone capable of threatening multiple realities, Dreamy Bowser, a reality warper of an already powerful beast, Fury Bowser, which is the already powerful Bowser, becoming even more powerful by powering up to his size with the Giga Bell, and if we are counting the Paperverse in with regular Mario, he also kills the Shadow Queen, another satanic figure, and Super
Super Dementio, another reality warper. Keep in mind that unlike with the Kirby games where Kirby has to get some powerful artifact to beat his powerful beings, like the Star Sprinkler or the Star Rod, Mario is more than capable of already going toe-to-toe -to -toe against these powerful monsters with just his fists, feet, and hammer. For q like Dreamy Bowser, the Mega Bug, and the Dark Star, Mario doesn't even need any kind of story power-up to fight them to the death, with the Dark Star even being forced into absorbing Bowser's power to stand a chance against Mario. And if all this doesn't convince you, Mario's able to summon the Keyblade. You know, that, that sword from Kingdom Hearts that only presents itself to those worthy of it? Mario's able to summon that and have it bring forth Sora for Smash Brothers. Can Kirby do that? No. He can only make one out of stars that knows three moves. Case closed. Seriously though, thanks to the Mushroom Kingdom treating logic more as a suggestion rather than a rule, the insane power given to him at birth and all these incredible feats he's able to pull off during his years, we have to dip our hats toward the man in red and call Mario the strongest face in Nintendo's pantheon of heroes. But like we said, this was a bit of a subjective topic. So what do you think? Let us know in the comments section who you think is the most powerful Nintendo hero. Remember, if you need a one-up, be sure to hit that notification bell and binge our other Nintendo videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.